Okay, folks, the three chapters that we're going to be dealing with, uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14, understanding the Bible, what the Bible is, and developing an effective Bible study. Now, just from your notes, they've got seven points there why some people do not understand the Bible. Some of these things overlap, but we'll just get a couple of scriptures that sort of line up with them, seeing uh, your uh, exams on the uh, notes. First of all, uh, we do not study the Bible. We study with a closed mind. We are hindered by tradition. Some try to prove a point. Some do not love the truth. The Bible in a disorganized manner. So the first point there, some do not study the Bible. It says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul writing to Timothy says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Holy Spirit isn't going to read the Bible to us, not going to just drop the word of God into our minds while we're lying on our bed. There's a bit of work that we've got to do. Okay, so I'm study with a closed mind. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 7 says this, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we sometimes across people that have got theological degrees and uh, there's a question mark in our minds afterwards whether they actually are even born again. And uh, so it is possible to study the Word of God. I mean, it's possible to spend time in the presence of Jesus and to be a Judas. So really it's up to us to make sure that we have an open mind Hindered by tradition. One of the reasons that people do not understand the Bible is that the authority of the Bible has been under, undermined. Often this has been done by making something else more authoritative than the Bible. He spoke about this. He said to the Pharisees in Matthew 15, verse 6 and 9, Thus you nullify the word of God. The teachings of the rules taught by men. Let's try to get through quickly, just in case we have more problems. Okay, some don't study the truth. Uh, some don't love the truth. They study with closed minds. They interpret the scripture in the light of their own pet doctrines. Some do this to gain popularity and prosperity, tickling people's ears with a palatable gospel that doesn't offend. All warned of those who would turn away from the truth to get a following. And in Acts chapter 20, this is what he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and will distort the truth in order to draw disciples after them. Philippians 1 verse 15 to 18, P, uh, Paul speaks about those that preach Christ out of envy, rivalry, and um, saying that they preach out of selfish ambition, not sincerely trying to actually make things worse for him while he's in his chains. And this is their motivation for preaching the Bible. Some are blinded by worldly living. It says in 1 Timothy 6 verse 3 to 5, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with sound instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to godly teaching they are conceited and they understand nothing. So this is why they don't understand. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies, Quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Well, you know, if you uh, look at some of the TV networks, you'll find that probably the majority of people can fit into that category. And then some people will study the Bible in a disorganized manner. And we'll look at Bible study methods later and see how we can study more effectively. That's the last chapter. Okay, so now coming to the next chapter, what is the Bible? There's three basic 
Christian truths. First of all, that God exists, that he has revealed himself in a way that's understandable to people, and this revelation has been preserved for us in the Bible. So the Bible is God's revelation of himself to man. So when a person begins to doubt the word of God, he becomes his own authority, and this is the kind of secular society we live in today. We live in a society in which humanism is the rising religion because Satan has blinded men's eyes to the word of God. So with secular humanism, man created God, that's what they say, as a projection of his own mind. And so the mind of man guides his morality. Christian worldview, we see that God made mankind in his own image. Sorry. (coughs) And so biblical principles guide morality. Now, from the notes, we see, they say in Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his son. And the five ways that they mention there is obviously dreams and visions, speaking mouth to mouth, by putting exact words in the mouth of a prophet, through angels, and through Jesus, and there's scriptures for all of these. Another form of revelation is by means of um, creation. It says in Romans 1 that people are without excuse because God's revealed himself through creation. Now the church is also God's revelation to man and to Satan. It says in Ephesians 3 verse 8 to 10, This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. So even to the divine council, the church is the means which God has made known his his, uh, plans and his purposes. So at this point in time, Satan knows the gospel. Let me just admit David. And he knows God's plan of redemption. So what does he do? He gets people not to believe the word. Okay, he he has made it his mission to keep man in the dark because revelation is not enough. We need a good (coughs) action. And this we see in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 to 4. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, who is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So revelation isn't enough. We need God to illuminate it. And then obviously we need to appropriate it in our lives. Now coming to scripture, we see Peter says that we do well to pay attention to the Bible because it's completely reliable. And he says we must pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So that is until we actually have illumination and the morning star rises in your hearts and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the Word of God is so that the living Word of God can be revealed to us. So you get to the place where you say, the reason why I believe in Jesus is not because of the Bible. I believe in Jesus because I've experienced him. I believe in Jesus because he's in my life. He's made a difference. And that's the personal testimony is when the morning star has risen in your hearts. Okay. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Jesus said this about the scriptures. Now, Jesus is a historical fact. There's no argument in it, and uh, we'll touch on that a little later. But uh, Jesus didn't have any question marks about the Jewish scriptures, which is our Old Testament. And in Luke 24, it says this, How foolish you are, 
when he is on the road to Emmaus, he says to these guys, how foolish you are, how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, which is the Pentateuch, and all the prophets, he explained to them what the scripture said concerning himself. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, the prophets, minor and major, and the Psalms. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. It's just a lit. It's our phone. Okay, so coming from our notes, we see that there are a number of things which point to the inspiration in the Word of God. First of all, the unity of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, the theme of the Bible is God's plan to save man from sin. All teachings to guide men to have a right relationship with God and his fellow man are harmonious throughout Scripture. There's no contradictions, no inconsistencies. Those who do not know the Bible claim that it contradicts itself, but uh, if you actually ask them, they can't point out where these contradictions are. One of the interesting things is you'll find that Muslims will say that our Bible is corrupted. But if you listen to those two ladies who were imprisoned in Iran, you'll find that what they do is they take the Gospel of Barnabas, which is a corrupt uh, um, book, and uh, they, they say that that's, that's the truth. And they base the argument on the Gospel of Barnabas, which is a corruption. So the Bible isn't a single book. It's actually 66 individual books written on three continents, in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, over a period of 1,500 years by 40 authors who came from many walks of life, shepherds, kings, scholars, fishermen, prophets, a doctor, a military general, and a Pharisee. One unified book from beginning to end without contradiction. This is evidence of the Bible being God's word. The next thing that proves the inspiration of scripture is its indestructibility. For 2,600 years, people have tried to destroy the Bible, and yet it still remains. We know of how the communists tried to uh, eradicate it. We have seen um, Muslim countries uh, more recently have tried to get rid of the Bible and heap persecution on Christians. We see a country like North Korea, where you can get imprisoned and you can actually be put to death just for owning a Bible. There's a saying, Homer must be handled with care. The illusion, of course, is the compositions of this blind poet, Homer, of ancient Greece. The implication in this proverb is Homer's works have been treasured and preserved cautiously for centuries. And this is what amazing man will look at Homer's works and they'll say, this is a fantastic work. Yet in spite of this meticulous care, only a few copies of Homer's writings survive. There is no complete copy of the poet's works prior to the 13th century AD. It's 700 years ago. More than 2,000 years after the writer lived. In contrast, the Bible, though viciously opposed and oppressed across several millennia, is reflected in thousands of Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, and even today continues to be the best-selling publication in the world. I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, You could get the notes off the internet when government posts this. But we can see how over and over in Scripture, there have been attempts to try and hide and um, eradicate the Word of God. We see how the Old Testament books survived the captivities that Israel went into. Antiochus Epiphanes, this is worth mentioning. During the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, Antiochus Epiphanes, a wicked Syrian tyrant, took Jerusalem by treachery in 165 BC. He desecrated the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. That's why some people thought he was the Antichrist. Destroyed all the copies of the scriptures that he found, and he murdered those who had them. He was popularly known as the Madman. He launched a bloody persecution against the Hebrew people. One aspect of his vendetta was to attempt to destroy copies of the Jewish scriptures. An ancient document records this episode. 
and the officials of Antiochus rent in pieces the books of the law which they found and set them on fire. And wheresoever was found with any book of the covenant, and if any consented to the law, the king sentenced them to, to death. And that's well from one of the books of the Apocrypha, 1 Maccabees. The historian Josephus comments on this event, and he says, And if there were any sacred book of the law found, it was destroyed, and those Jews with whom they were found miserably perished also. We see how the scriptures survived um, when Jerusalem was captured by Crassus. We see how it survived when in AD 70 the Roman general destroyed Jerusalem and he destroyed uh, the temple. Roman, Roman emperor Diocletian, known for persecution of Christians, he had no tolerance for Christianity, he called it a cult. He initiated the most terrible of all persecutions of the early church in 302 AD, and he told his government to tear down the churches to the foundations. He realized that the Bible was the source of the Christians' courage, so he ordered the burning of the scriptures. Only ten years later, Constantine the Great, the professing Christian, ordered the writing of many copies of the Bible and encouraged everyone in the Roman Empire to read it. So over and over, people have tried to destroy the Bible. Satan has tried to limit its uh, availability. We see that following the fall of the Roman Empire, very few had access to the Bible. And those that did only had access to the Vulgate, which was written in Latin, which at that point in time, very few people knew. And it suited the Catholic Church, especially because then the priests could interpret things as they liked. But the stirrings that preceded the Reformation sparked renewed interest in it. However, those who tried to increase its availability were persecuted. When you look at the Bible today, and you've got it on your cell phone, and you've got it on the internet, and you've got it uh, in printed copies, that was bought with the blood of men and women who were prepared to sacrifice their lives to translate it. I've just been listening to the account of William Carey, and you see how William Carey translated the scriptures into Sanskrit, which was the dialect which the intellectual people in India used to read. Um, <coughs> excuse me, who's the guy in... Um, uh, there's another guy from America. He was the first missionary as well. He uh, translated the Bible as well. But uh, these, these Bibles are, are still available today. Aaron Ira Judson, that's right. John Wycliffe made the first translation of the Bible into English. And what they did is he died, but just to show how annoyed they were with him, they had his bones exhumed, they burnt the ashes and they scattered them in the river. John Huss was burnt alive in Bohemia because he proclaimed that the Bible was the final authority. So these people who stood up against the false doctrines that were being taught in the church, they paid for it with their lives. And his ashes were thrown into the Rhine. William Tyndall translated the New Testament into English in 1526. It was banned, he was convicted of heresy, and he was burnt at the stake in Antwerp, Holland. The English queen, Mary Tudor, who was known as Bloody Mary, Mary, ordered that anyone possessing a Bible should be burnt, and thousands were martyred during her reign. Five years after she launched the persecution, she was succeeded by Queen Elizabeth, who ordered 130 editions of the Bible to be published. So over and over, the Lord had ways of counteracting Satan's attempts to destroy the Word of God. The third thing that shows the divine inspiration of the Word of God is the social impact of the Bible. The Bible has made an enormous social impact on society. No work of literature has ever influenced societies more than the Bible. Literally billions of people in history have been touched by the Scriptures. Certainly if it were an invention of men alone, it would have no such impact on history. People have been brought out of cannibalism and slavery. Practices like safety and infanticide have been outlawed. Sadly, in our modern-day era, as secular humanists have tried to eradicate the Judeo-Christian influence and have certain parts of the Bible declared as hate speech. We have seen a return to barbaric practices like abortion and the parading of perversion as an alternative lifestyle. The fourth indication of its divine source is the historical reliability of the Bible. 
There are two things that are used to judge whether a document is reliable. First of all, does it contain eyewitness testimony? The New Testament consists of 27 books that were written by authors who either were eyewitnesses to Jesus or interviewed eyewitnesses of him. How early are the copies we have? Any writing of history is judged by how close the writing is to the events it records. The New Testament events all occurred in the first century and all of the writings were written in the first century. So one can see how close that is and how accurate it is. The books of the New Testament were written between 55 and 96 AD and uh, between AD 100 and 200 they were collected and read in the churches. This can be seen, for example, in the writings of Irenaeus. He mentions all books of the New Testament except for three and uh, he lived from AD 130 to 200. Okay, thirdly, another thing that, this, uh, that um, shows the historical reliability of a document is how many copies do you have? Historical documents are viewed as more reliable if they have more copies. The reason for this is that mass printing wasn't invented until 1440 AD by Johannes Gutenberg. In fact, the first book printed on the printing press was the Bible. Before that, scribes had to copy the writings by hand so that they could be distributed to other areas. The New Testament has been preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient work. There are over 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, and 9,300 manuscripts in various other ancient languages, including all those languages over there. It's from Wikipedia. The historical Jesus. There are 10 non-Christian writers who mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. By contrast, over the same 150 years, there are nine non-Christian sources who mention Tiberius Caesar. Now, nobody has a problem saying that Tiberius Caesar existed, but people question Jesus. Jesus is actually mentioned one more source, by one more source in the Roman Emperor of the time. If you include the Christian sources, authors mentioning Jesus, outnumber those mentioning Tiberius, 43 to 10. The fifth thing that proves the reliability of the Word of God is for false uh, prophecies. There are 2,500 prophecies in the Bible, 2,000 of which have been fulfilled to the letter. No errors. No 300 prophecies in total were fulfilled by Jesus. The odds of one man fulfilling just eight of these prophecies of one is one in, and you can look at that, one in, I think there's about 17 zeros there. Essentially impossible, which shows that God had to be uh, involved. For example, his place of birth, his date of birth, his manner of birth, his manner of death, his burial. Okay, now coming to the last chapter, which is developing an effective Bible study. Sorry I'm rushing through, just trying to stay on track after that delay that we had. Okay, schedule in time every week just for studying the Word. And folks, forget about the fact that we here are trying to do a course and wanting to get some kind of, um, you know, certificate or diploma or degree, whatever the case may be. Every Christian should study the Bible every week and we should schedule in time to do it. And a vital element of effective Bible study is prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher before reading the Bible. Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Psalm 119 verse 105, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to your path. Folks, with what we have as modern day technology, it's absolutely amazing. I've got an app on my phone that, you know, <coughs> as you can hear, I'm battling with this constant cough. It's one of the side effects of the blood pressure tablets that I'm on. So I've been back in reading. So Bev and I always have the Bible ready every night. So I've got this Bible app on my phone 
And basically, I'll show you, yeah, you've got the Bible there, can you just push there? Chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, share in the heavenly calling. So, basically you don't even have to read the Bible. You can have the Bible read to you. And these are apps that it's easy to, to download. We have absolutely no excuse. You think of people that have been brought up in societies where there has been no Bible, or Christians that have actually have one little page of the Bible, and they've passed it in amongst themselves, and people that have treasured the Bible. We have the Bible at our fingertips all the time. Okay, now this is the hand method of how to get to know the Word of God. And basically, it's just using your five fingers on your hand. Basically, the four fingers are all used in unison with the thumb. Okay. Hear the Bible, meditate upon it. Read the Bible, meditate upon it. Study the Bible, meditate upon it. Memorize the Bible, meditate upon it. These are the scriptures if you want to look them up. Okay. So how do we get to know the Word of God? We get to know the Word of God through hearing. John 6, verse 12 to 13, So when they were full, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain. Now this is when Jesus fed the 5,000, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up, and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments from the five loaves, barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten now, what was Jesus trying to teach them? Not to litter? Jesus was teaching them to, well, I suppose in one way, he was showing them that they actually had more in the end to, uh, than what they had to start with. But to gather up the fragments, how do you do that? When you go to a, a meeting, how do you gather up the fragments? Take notes, you know. Go over it again. So don't allow anything to be lost because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Secondly, we get to know the Bible through reading. Revelation 1.3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Okay, so... How do you get to know God's word by reading? Well, I want to give you a couple of methods that you should avoid. The first one is the box of chocolates. Um, I don't know how many of you like chocolates, but the fact of the matter is if you just eat chocolates, you're not going to be very healthy. Okay. And some people, that's how they live. They live on promise boxes and fridge magnets. And none of them say, if any man would live godly in Christ Jesus, he shall suffer persecution. That doesn't make a nice scripture to put on the fridge. That doesn't make a nice scripture to read before you're going to start the day. Okay, so get away from the box of chocolates method. It's not a good one. Okay, the deep sea fishing one is when people are looking for something between the lines. And I'm sure you've come across people and they've actually seen things that no one else has seen in the scripture. And when you look at it, you certainly can't see where they found it. The lucky dip method, now I know that this sometimes works when Christians are immature and when they're young. And I believe that just as we are, we love our kids and we make allowances when our kids are little, um, we expect our kids to grow up. We expect our kids to learn how to pray, uh, ask properly. Your child might not be able to be able to say, please and thank you when they're two years old. But if they're 12 years old and they want saying please and thank you, you're going to have a problem with it. And so God expects us to grow up. So maybe you flipped through the Bible when you were young and said, Lord, please show me your scripture. I'm sure you've all heard the one where this guy flipped through the Bible and it said, Judas went to hang himself and didn't like that. And uh, flipped through the Bible again and came on thinking and it says, um, go down and do likewise. So, <laughs> you know, you can sort of like end up with that type of thing. The first aid method is when you use the Bible in emergencies. Okay. Sometimes people use prayer like that as well. So in emergencies, they go to the Word of God. The Word of God must be something that's part of our daily routine. Thirdly, we get to know God's Word through study. This is a scripture that's been quoted a number of times in 
um, the Bible College. Acts 17 verse 11 says the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Your responsibility is to see that what you have been taught is scriptural. How many of these mega churches and these churches that teach false doctrine would have people if people actually went and examined the scriptures to see if what they were being taught was sound? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself a proof to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, some methods of study. You can do a character study. You can, for example, look at the life of Simon Peter, and you can look at the character of Simon Peter, and, you know, try and glean things out of Scripture from that. You can do a topical study. You can perhaps study the topic of faith. You can do a word study. You can do an analysis of a verse. You can do an analysis of a chapter. You can study a book of the Bible. You can combine a character study and a topical study. So there are, other, there are a number of ways that you can get about, you know, studying topics. And, um, you know, that's how uh, some of our ministry, I'm sure Gavin does it as well, uh, is developed. We, we look at uh, faith, and you go and look at all the scriptures concerning faith. How do you get faith? How does your faith increase? How do you exercise faith? How is your faith tested? So all these things are found in scripture. What is the source of faith? What is the object of faith? Okay, fourthly, we need to memorize God's Word. And this is something that's very important, I believe, because there have been so many occasions where Christians who have been locked up have had to survive on what has been hidden in their heart. They haven't had any physical Word of God. Okay. And so in Proverbs 7, verse 1 to 3, it says, My son... Keep my words. Store up my commands within you. How do you do that? You do that by memorization. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablets of your heart. That's memorization. We know how in the Old Testament it says, the the words of this thing, write them on the doorposts of your house. Tell them to your children when you rise, when you go to sleep. Um, you know, in the old days, people used to pride themselves of having a family devotion, where people would actually, when they sat down to eat, they would open the Bible and they'd discuss the Bible. People sit now and they eat their food in front of the television and fill their mind with that kind of junk. Psalm 119, 11, thy word have I hidden my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of God dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in songs, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's how vital fellowship is. We're in a situation now where, due to what's going on in the country and in the world, fellowship has been limited. And uh, for a number of uh, weeks, actually uh, two months, we weren't able to have a fellowship. And they're talking of introducing... Uh, some rigid methods again. The fact of the matter is, do you, does fellowship mean as much to you as it means to the people in closed countries who put their lives at risk in order to go and meet with other Christians? That's how important it is to have fellowship. That's how important it is to encourage one another. Deuteronomy, I didn't realize I had this verse down. So this is the one I was referring to, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 18 to 21. Fix these words of mine on your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses, on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land. The Lord sought to give your ancestors. If your children don't know the word of God, it's not because they have removed religious instruction from the schools. It's not the school's job to teach them. It's yours. God will hold you accountable if you don't bring your children up in the word of God. And then fifthly, meditate on God's word. 
And this, as I said, goes hand in hand with the previous methods. Okay, so hear God's word, meditate. Read God's word, meditate. Study God's word, meditate. Memorize God's word, meditate. And you'll find that the Lord just opens up his word to you and blesses you and gives you insight. Joshua 1 verse 8, keep this book of the Lord always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. What a promise. Ponder what you have read. Is this a mistake to avoid? Is this a command I must carry out? Is this a sin that I must put off? Is this a promise that I need to believe? Think about what you read and don't be in a hurry. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 2, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Okay, now, some of these things Gavin has touched on. There is a bit of overlap in some of these chapters, but I just wanted to briefly mention some of these things. Pay attention to rules of interpretation. Pay attention to context. Consider the simple and most obvious meaning is correct. The Bible is of itself its best interpretation. We need to study the Old Testament out of the view of the New Testament. Hermeneutics is the theory and methodology of interpretation of biblical text. The distinction between exegesis and hermeneutics is a thin line. Hermeneutics is the field of study which is concerned with how we interpret the Bible, whereas exegesis is the actual interpretation of the Bible by drawing the meaning out of the biblical text. So you take one verse and you do an exegesis on that, and you get the meaning of that particular text. But hermeneutics is a field of study that sets down certain rules on how you're supposed to interpret And um, I think this is the last point, okay. The five C's, okay. There are five clues that can help you to determine the author's main point because Gavin has mentioned this as well. It doesn't really matter what you think Paul was saying. What matters is what Paul was saying. And if you want to know what Paul was saying, you need to put yourself into Paul's culture and you need to pay attention. So I'm jumping ahead of myself. So the first thing is context. You can answer 75% of your questions about the passage when you read the full context of the text. Often these wonderful little scriptures that are found in a promise box, if you had to put them in context, you wouldn't want to actually read them because um, the plans I have... Behold the plans I have uh, for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's written to people who actually have gone into 70 years of exile because they didn't listen to God. So God had plans for them, but they ended up in exile because they didn't obey Him. So it doesn't matter what God's plans are for you. If you're disobedient, you ain't going to benefit from His plans. You're going to actually reap the consequences of your behavior. Cross-reference. Is the second thing that you need to do with scripture. Let, you, let scripture interpret scripture. That is, let other passages in the Bible shed light on the passage that you're looking at. Then the culture, as I was saying, the Bible was written long ago, so when we interpret it, we don't interpret it in the 20th century or 21st century culture. We need to actually go back. And some of the things that have been taught legalistically in the church have been things that were done in a certain, cult, a certain cultural city that were imposed upon people as a form of legalism. The Bible was written long ago, and when we interpret it, <coughs> we need to understand it from the writer's cultural concept, context. Conclusion. Having answered your questions for understanding by means of context, cross-reference, and culture, you can make a preliminary statement about the passage's meaning before you look at point five. Point five is the commentaries. So once you've gone through context, cross-reference, culture, say to the Lord, Lord, just show me your word. 